Welcome back to the David Curtin Show on today's News Talk TNT. And it is fantastic to have with me today Lois McClatchy Miller, who is a senior legal communications officer, I believe, at ADF UK. Lois, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Now, really good to have you on. And one thing that we've spoken about quite a lot on TNT over the last week, because it is a really big issue, is this new bill in Scotland that has become an act yesterday on the 1st of April. It's, it's an act that's come into force called the Public Order and Hate Crime Scotland Act. And a lot of people are very, very concerned about how this is going to affect free speech and something you've spoken about quite a lot. How do you think it's going to affect you, people you know, and people who have just generally got normal everyday opinions in this country? Sure. Well, you, you read out the long name of the act, but most people call it just the hate speech law for short, because that's what it really is about. Uh, it's talks about hate speech. And of course, nobody likes to be hated. Very few people actually like to make anyone around them feel hated. I know I certainly don't. Uh, but unfortunately, the bill goes much further than tackling whatever hate speech is because it doesn't define what hate speech is. So when we look at this law, this vague and far reaching piece of legislation, people in Scotland like myself are not clear, not sure what they can say uh, how they can discuss sensitive topics about gender, about marriage, about things that are really important in our society without potentially being guilty of offending somebody, of making somebody complain to police that they have felt hated because of the views that we have expressed. Obviously, this puts a number of people in a very difficult situation. Feminists, for example, who are very committed to upholding uh, the biological reality of women. Um, Christians' parents who would say that no child has ever been born in the wrong body and we must do all that we can to support a child to feel confident in their own skin and not to uh, be pushed into a dangerous path to transition. Uh, it makes uh, religious groups who defend marriage between a man and a woman, for example, at risk of being prosecuted simply for expressing their beliefs, which is not uh, something that a, a modern society should ever uh, be playing with. Well, I think you you hit it in the nail on the head there when you say this is about hate speech, but hate speech is not defined properly. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows what's going on because people have been able to say things before, but we've gradually seen our free speech eroded. I mean, we've already seen people have been um, harassed by the police for many of those opinions that you've just mentioned, you know, that there are two sexes, male and female, or marriage as a man and a woman, for example, which most people, I think 90% plus of people would agree on those things. But now there's a possibility of someone just complaining because they feel offended by it, the police can come around and you can get seven years in prison. I mean, how do people feel about this in Scotland? Uh, it's a very harsh law, up to seven years in prison, as you say, uh, is the maximum penalty. And there's uh, there's also many disturbing parts of law. For example, there's no um, provision for one's dwelling space, one's family home. So conversations that take place at the dinner table between families, if they're you know if kids are encouraged to report uh, what they find or what they've been told is hateful speech, and they report their parents for having discussed you know sensitive issues about gender in society, um, then that could get their parents in trouble. We're in a we're going into to a state, mm. uh, which is a very, uh, he said, she said, culture, which will put people off from having these conversations in the first place if they don't want to deal with the headache of mm. uh, of facing you know, a potential investigation. Now, we've seen a lot of headlines come out about JK Rowling in the last 24 hours. Of course, um, she is well known for having discussed her gender critical views online about protecting women's spaces, rape crisis centers, women's prisons, uh, etc. All very common sense views about how to keep women safe uh, in vulnerable spaces. Now, she has, uh, or many activists have have said that they are targeting her with complaints. Uh, it's very easy to file a complaint. You can do it online. You can do it on the phone. You can go to one of over 400 centres that have been set up across Scotland uh, where people can go and snitch or <laughs> go and say that they have heard somebody say something hateful. Uh, as an aside, very strangely, uh, one of these centres seems to be a sex shop in Glasgow. Another seems to be a mushroom farm in the borders. One's even a 
derelict building uh, that no one's used for many years. So a very odd setup when it comes to reporting hate crimes. But now, you know, people are going to be able to to go and, and tell the police on, you know, tell people on the police who have just expressed uh, their deeply held beliefs, their views, uh, and, and it creates a culture where nobody will feel comfortable to engage in conversations at all. It's a horrible thing. Um, I, I I love Scotland. Uh, you know, I went to, to university in Scotland and, it, you know, it pains me to see um, this kind of thing being introduced there. But look, Lois, don't go away. We're going to have Sorry. a quick news break and come back uh, in a minute or so. This is today's News Talk TNT. Welcome back to the today's News Talk TNT. And Lois McClatchy Miller from ADF UK is here to talk about the hate speech act in scotland which is a horrendous assault on free speech i mean we've spoken about this uh, a lot just before the break but another disturbing thing about this law is that it appears that they are claiming jurisdiction almost worldwide because this law gives them provisions to arrest or hold anybody accountable to criminal penalties as long as they say something that can be read in Scotland. So it's not limited to what people say on the street or publish in a Scottish newspaper. I mean, I could be here in England and I could say something um, that someone in Scotland reports to the police and they could come and uh, press charges against me, which to me is also quite frightening. Is is that the case? <laughs> Well, this is the kind of ridiculous thing about hate speech laws in Scotland, but also you know, being considered in Ireland and having been rolled out other in other countries across the world. We now live in a society which isn't constrained by geography and by community, but we can share materials across borders, and we do in a, every single day. Hmm. And so this puts you know social media companies, for example, in a very difficult situation. Now, are they to censor uh, people's free conversation across the world just because a Scot might read it and a Scot might think that it's hateful? We don't know, and it would be very interesting when it comes to Ireland's hate speech bill, uh, which is moving through their parliament right now because X, uh, or formerly known as Twitter, has their international headquarters in Dublin. So they uh, they will have their directors uh, being accountable uh, to the Irish government especially. Uh, but as you say, this extends um, a, an extreme form of censorship, not only in Scotland, uh, but across the world. And it is akin uh, to something that we used to have in Scotland a long time ago. Um, it was in 1697 that the last man in Scotland was condemned for blasphemy, for mm. speaking out against the dominant faith, the dominant religion of the day. And that never should have happened. Uh, that was an awful law that was in place that, that, that prevented people from having open conversations about Christianity. But this really is just a reverse blasphemy law. This puts uh, the government in charge of deciding what can be said, what can be questioned and what cannot be about the most popular orthodoxies of our day. So I'm very concerned to see this kind of back in mm. Scotland. It's, it seems here, yeah, again, this is almost like a, a collection of intersectional ideologies that if you um, cross one of them, then you can be brought before the courts, the police will arrest you under hate speech laws. But, you know, th there's nothing there about offending Christians or Christianity. It still seems like you could say anything you like about Christianity or the Bible, that would be fine. But if you offend an LGBT NGO, or you say something is deemed to be Islamophobic or anti-Semitic, or racist, any sort of BME, BLM NGOs as well, that's where you will fall foul of this law. So there's certain groups that have extra power to make accusations against people, you know, of saying things that are offensive. Is that is that sort of how this is going to work? Well, the pushback that you would receive, David, is that there is a category, a protected category for race and religion. Um, but that isn't really how we should be defining ourselves in, in, in our country. We should be able to criticize religion. I'm a Christian and I invite people uh, to, to, to criticize my assumptions and have that conversation with me. We shouldn't be sheltering any religion uh, from uh, criticism, from debate and discussion. And there is some provisions in the law for that. Uh, but with the uncertainty of the wording about stirring up hate, 
It's very unclear how this will land, for example, in a court case. But if we look across the world where hate speech laws have been put in place, and ADF International have been working on this globally for a long time. We've got cases in Finland where uh, a parliamentarian and a grandmother has been on trial uh, three times because of a tweet where she tweeted a Bible verse and challenged her church for sponsoring the Pride Parade, something that she didn't think they had the place to be doing so. That was in Finland, in Mexico. Uh, we've been involved in supporting the defence of two politicians uh, from different parties, different ideologies, who both hold uh, views about the biological reality of women, uh, had expressed their views on Twitter and were convicted of gender-based political violence and placed on an offender's register for expressing that belief on Twitter or X. So we know the pattern of this. We know how it goes. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see cases come up like this in Scotland where people uh, are facing investigations or even trials for the beliefs that they express uh, on Twitter, online, even in peaceful ways, uh, because of the, the ambiguity of the law, which allows for basically the state uh, or the person complaining to determine whether someone has mm. intended to be hateful or not, which of course nobody will ever be able to tell what somebody's intention was. Perhaps they intended uh, to um, engage in a really interesting conversation or to, to learn more <laughs> about someone's beliefs. But if they're interpreted to have stirred mm. up hatred, that could uh, could lead to a very challenging investigation. Well, this is the thing. It's subjective, isn't it? I mean, my view is, and as, as the leader of a political party, the Heritage mm -hmm. Party in the UK, um, the concept of hate should not be in law at all because it is right. subjective. It, it, the law should be objective. It should include things like incitement to violence or incitement to crime or harassment or abuse because you can clearly tell if that is the case. But if hatred is trying to ascertain subjectively what someone might feel or how they might have been motivated when they said something and one person could say something and, and get away with it completely and another person could say exactly the same thing but then someone might say oh I feel that was um stirring up hatred <laughs> and then they could be, yeah. um find themselves on the the wrong end of the law that's right. Yeah. Hatred is a, as an emotion of the human heart, isn't it? So no matter, you know, Hamza Youssef, Justin Trudeau, any of these guys who are trying to criminalize hatred, they will never be successful because it is a part of the human experience. Unfortunately, and I don't like hatred. and I don't think I don't encourage it in any sense. Uh, but when it comes to emotions and responses, um, the way to deal with kind of bad speech or deal with, you know, disliked points of views in society is to debate them, to, to show different points of view and to, to engage in the with open conversations which will persuade others to change their mind to change their views but censorship pushing views underground saying that these people cannot be heard or seen is only going to allow any bad views to fester mm. so what we need in our country is open conversation and not shut down Absolutely. And what I would say is, you know, well, I'm trying to do something about this because I'm trying to get candidates ready to stand in the elections. Mm -hmm. And if we do get people in in Holyrood uh, in Edinburgh, then we can just repeal this ridiculous law and we can go back to the law being objective uh, like it should be. I mean, that's the, the only solution I can think of at the moment. But uh, um, Lois, uh, thank you for coming to talk to me about this. And uh, I hope that um, people can uh, carry on living um without this having too much of an effect on their lives and hopefully um it will just fail and fall under its own weight uh of, of ridiculousness we shall see how it goes thanks lois so much